Good morning, Zain. Good, good morning, Frank. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks a bunch for making uh, some, time, uh, some time to talk to me. I, I know how busy you are and, and you have been over the last few months. Um, so thank you. No, no, it's a pleasure to be here, and especially after watching the recording of your podcast with uh, William Shabas and and um, Diana Butu. Diana, yeah, I think it was a brilliant yeah. um, um, discussion. Oh, yeah. thanks. Yeah, yeah, I loved it as well. I thought they were like both of them were very com complimentary as well, and and you know, uh, complemented each other very well. Um, look, it, it's 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 so good to talk to you because like you are, you've been one of one of the driver uh, of this case. You have been uh, the person pushing first for South Africa to take on this case at the ICJ. And, and then you've been in, uh, in charge, I guess with others, of putting the legal team uh, together. Um, I'll just quickly tell people who you are. So you are the Director General of the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, which is the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, so um, can you, because look, like October the 7th happened um, very quickly. We knew what Israel was going to do, and, and it did, but I think it did at, at a level that maybe surprised even the, the, the more pessimistic of us. And and very quickly, um, some lawyers, um, I'm thinking of like my friend Daniel Makova in the UK, for example, uh, said like, we need one state that is a, a signatory of the uh, Genocide Convention to take on this case to the ICJ. And one state is enough to start the process. I was wondering, I mean, I don't know how much you can tell me, obviously some details must, I guess, remain um, secret or private, but could you explain to us the process and uh, and in a way I'm not gonna why do you think it took so long for a country to actually take on the case? Thanks. So you know, let me let me start firstly just with with how we got the case going. So you know, after long deliberations, and I'll, I'll come back to that, the cabinet of South Africa without much debate, it was presented then to, to cabinet that we needed to take this case to the ICJ using Article 9 of the convention. And cabinet gave us a, an instruction to do so. And I think it was done based on just the magnitude of what we were seeing at that point unfolding in Gaza. Um, it comes back to the question that you've, you asked, but why and why did it take so long? If you look at the events since October 7th, I mean, South Africa started talking about war crimes, crimes against humanity rather early. Um, but very quickly when we saw that there was systemic, there was a systemic pattern to civilian destruction and destruction of, 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 of public infrastructure, hospitals, schools, and engaging with various um, um, stakeholders. I mean, all the elements for the crime of genocide were, were then emerging. Um, we, we, the first institution of global governance we approached was the International Criminal Court, where we were charging those most responsible under the, the principles of command um, responsibility and superior responsibility for the crime of genocide under their own statute. And South Africa with Djibouti, Comoros, Bolivia, uh, and Bangladesh um, did this. Uh, so <clears throat> already we were signaling that we needed to use the institutions of global governance to hold Israel to account. And in this case, we were hoping that given that the ICC itself had an open case, um, you know, and, and I think you were involved with the Russell Tribunal, so you know the, the difficulties of, of, um, of just getting you know, Palestine to, to put itself under the jurisdiction of the ICC and the pressure that they were getting from the European Union. Um, and others in 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 the lead up to that, but we were hoping that this time, given the evidence that you had, and I think it was Blinner in her own oral argument stated that this is the first time that you have the people being subjected to genocide, forming their own demise, right? And this was at play before this argument. It was there when we made the case before the the ICC in November already. 
you also had, we were hoping that um, the, the Security Council itself will play a meaningful role. But we saw there was going to be no binding ceasefire or any kind of halt to the actions being taken by Israel through the Security Council because of the veto being exercised by the U.S. and others, uh, but mostly by the U.S. in terms of the ceasefire issues. So, you know, given the gravity, given the magnitude, we felt that as a responsible state party to the convention, we needed to approach the convention. We saw the emails coming in from people, to the minister, to the president, to myself, from all over the world. Um, but that was not the, you know, we, we, we took cognizance of what people were saying, um, but we really took it to the, we took the decision based on the magnitude and that there was no other avenue. There was no other avenue open to us other than to invoke the genocide convention to bring to the to bring to to the force some kind of process that will halt this unfolding genocide and as and as people have said it's a textbook case of genocide um and and that's the, that's the history and that's the process again i'm not sure how much you can tell me but did it take um because it's it's a massive risk also for South Africa to do this. I mean, people mm. have to understand that it's amazing. Uh, the public, public opinion is in uh, love with the legal team and, and with what South Africa is doing. But diplomatically, internationally, in terms of international relations, uh, in terms of you know um, collaboration with other countries, in terms of potentially losing very important friends, South Africa took a massive risk. So I was wondering, did it take much convincing? Because you had to go to the, even the president, right? Had to give his approval, I guess. Did it take much convincing? Or you felt like right away, you know, very soon in the process, people were like, it's our duty, in a way, it's our duty to do this. You know, we have to do it. Look, the, the, the president, and you'll see also when we, John Dugard's auto argument, when he argues the issue of jurisdiction, um, procedural jurisdiction, not subject matter jurisdiction. Um, we argues the fact that, you know, early on, our president, as early as October, November, was saying this is a genocide. He said it at various forums. We said it at the Security Council through our minister. We said it at the General Assembly. So as far as our leaders were concerned, the political leadership, this was genocide. And they were not just using the words lightly. Um, they were using it in, 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 in a very, and they had weighed up is this a genocide? Is it just you know? Is it war crimes? Is it crimes against humanity? But they they had enough knowledge about the fact that genocide has to have a special intent, and it's not just magnitude in terms of killing people. It's magnitude in terms of intent. And when they used the term, they used it with the seriousness that it deserved, even at that stage. So when approached that, in terms of Article One, we have a duty once we've identified this as a as genocide, and there's there's no other processes at play to stop this. As a state party, we've called it the genocide. We've identified it as plausibly being a genocide. We need to get the ICJ or some other organ of the UN. And in this case, it is the highest, the highest judicial organ. We said it should be the best approach, which is why we go in with Article Nine. Should be approached, and we because we felt and we explained that we are duty bound. Um, cabinet endorsed it. They didn't endorse just rubber stamp it. They engaged with it, but they endorsed it rather quickly because the entire cabinet has been uh, aware of that it is an unfolding genocide. And we were looking at where the other institutions of global governance, other tools at our disposal, would be able to bring quickly to an end, the, the, you know, the, the assault on the people of Gaza to an end. Um, but in the end, I don't think we had any other choice but to follow our obligations under the Genocide Convention to take this to the ICJ. So in a short answer, the, the debate was, the, the decision-making was quite quick. Yeah. And I guess you are aware of the symbolism and the fact that South Africa, a country that lived um, for how many decades? Like, uh, you know, for 40 years, 50 years, under the, one of the most brutal apartheid regime 
ever seen the fact that you guys in a way that today are representing the global south are, are taking on this case it's got incredible symbolism right yeah but and it's, it's ironic that at the time when we made the decision we didn't see ourselves as going there to represent the global south we just saw ourselves as a state party to the genocide convention where we have identified this as genocide and we have an obligation to to take it um uh, to the icj it's it's after we've done the application where the weight of of being you know a representative of the the, the global south dawned and it was not the intention it, it just emerged as um as something that people had brought to our attention and in the mobilization that took place afterwards so i think the history that we have as south africa having been colonized and having lived under the system of apartheid and then also you know we we helped launch amnesty international's report on israel as an apartheid state not because we wanted to do political point scoring but we, we were doing it in terms of the you know, we took a, you know what what are the legal implications of a state con- breaching the apartheid convention, the convention against apartheid, um, and we saw again that all the elements were in place. So, you know, so the political um, dimensions of what you you're explaining is something that, of course, we are now aware of, and we've been aware of the role that we have to play from a solidarity perspective, but. Really, you know, the decision to take it was just as a responsible state party to the genocide convention. Um, the other issues just came afterwards. So I guess the next step after getting the agreement and the OK and the green light in a way to, to do this was to, to form, to put a, a legal team together. You were also in charge of this, I guess, with others. Um, yeah. Could you explain again the process um, of picking people? to represent this case? So I think the, you know, I'm not going to go into all those details, but, I'm, but I, so South Africa, the, the Department of International Relations and Cooperation, working with the Department of Justice, and also, of course, the presidency, given the fact that this is a cabinet resolution, worked with various people that we thought could, could bring a successful argument on this case to the court. But of course, the first port of call was John Duga given the fact that he's um, one of the preeminent international legal scholars, and it helps that he's South African as well. Um, and, and John, then, in terms of the international team, started pointing out, these are the kinds of people you need on your team. And we approached them. Um, and then also in terms of the domestic team, you know, the Department of Justice and the presidency were quite clear, this is the kind of team we need to complement the, the international team that has been put together. And in the end, it was a really brilliant team. Um, so what we wanted to was to ensure that we have the people with the necessary experience, the necessary skills and knowledge of international law, because obviously this case, you know, you, you mentioned it earlier, uh, the, the risks associated with South Africa taking this. Israel has enjoyed institutional impunity for 75 years, you know, despite all the evidence. In the Russell Tribunal that you were part of collected evidence in 2014 already, the issue of genocide was on the table and discussed at the Russell Tribunal as well. Um, but no action was taken. Um, but so the risk of us not taking this to the court without the best available legal expertise is something that weighed heavy on us. Um, so the team that we have are people that we are confident um, will be able to you know, present the case ably uh, and beyond the provisional stage we, we're doing the provisional the, the arguments was dealing with the provisional stage but when we get into the merits uh, we're going to need the same kind of team uh, because we we may find that more con- countries intervene um, on the side of israel with a lot of resources that we may not have in terms of legal um you know uh, you know just the resources to get different legal expertise and skills in so we're going to need a team that can engage with all of that and I think the team we have is just absolutely brilliant. Can you give us maybe a, a, a feel? I know it's not like a football match, right? But um, when the team, uh, when the hearings closed or finished at The Hague um, a bit less than a week ago now, from the outside, you know, 
South Africa presented its case on the 11th. Israel presented its case on the 12th. Uh, we spoke about this uh, a few days ago with William Shabbas and, and Diana Butu. I mean, w William Shabbas, who is the foremost legal expert on genocide, said he'll give the South African team an A um, and, and the Israeli team a C minus only because he doesn't like to fail people. But I think he was very kind. What was the feel in, inside the South African delegation after the hearings? You know, before before Israel actually presented their arguments to the to the court, we were wondering whether we shouldn't look at challenging the procedural matters about having a right to reply. And you know, we were questioning: is it you know is there a specific rule that prevents a right to reply on, on provisional cases or not? And we were concerned about that. We needed a right to reply. Um, but after hearing what the arguments that Israel had put forward, we felt actually we don't need a right to reply. Um, we can do that through, you know, just media um, um, interviews. And in fact, if it was a normal court with normal adversarial processes, you know, um, our legal team, people like Max and and, and uh, Tembeka and others would have been able to quickly rebut just some of the evidence that was put forward very, very easily. I could have, I could have rebutted the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> support, yeah. yeah, and you know already on, on the internet you're getting um, documents with links that says argument X from Israel. This is why it's not true. Um, so our team would have been able to do that, but we really were not that concerned once we heard the, the because the arguments were not challenging the facts we we're putting on the table. I think the what we decided to do, our team decided to focus on facts, make the legal arguments, and you know show the show the the link between genocidal acts and genocidal intent and you know and, and genocidal statements and how this was then carried out by people on the ground so making the links between you know the foot soldiers internalizing the message that they were getting so we made the, the our arguments based on fact and law and what we found was that the the, the opposing team did not you know it was a lot of political uh, accusation um uh, a lot of um, you know you know sidetracking key issues, but not really the, in in detail challenging the issues that that we thought were important. So the mood was quite pensive and reflective, um, but also just um, you know discussions were around the fact that we 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 were more worried than we should have been about what they would have could have brought to the table. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting, actually, um, because like a, a few friends of mine that are legal experts um, were wondering about this right to reply. Um, and um, but I guess you, you've answered and we understood that, you know, I guess if Israel had made a, a quite a strong case, you might have taken the right to, you know, to reply. But seeing the weakness of the argument, which was not legal in any way, mm -hmm. in a way. Uh, I mean, William Shabbas uh, said again a few days ago that he felt um, they disres disrespected the court, you know. So, so I guess, yeah, you don't need, you know, they did mm. the job for you in, in a way. Uh, I wanted to ask you, because I don't want to take, you know, keep you for too long. I wanted to ask you about, I mean, it's very hard, I know, mm. um, to make uh, pronostics, you know. Um, but... And PMs, so provisional measures, are very different. I mean, the, the, I guess the, yeah. the highest threshold would be if the court com comes back, which could be very early, like next week or yeah. something, and says, and gives you like 100% in a way, they order Israel to stop the, the massacre yeah. in Gaza. I guess that would be the, the best scenario, right? But we know the court could also come back with like, softened in a way provisional measures so in a way what is the next step you think depending on on what comes out of the of the court in a, in a few weeks so we we are hoping of course that we get all that we've asked for um but if we don't get all that we've asked for what we want is at the minimum at least a, a call for whatever the the right term they would want to some form of a ceasefire to end the killing. You know, you have a situation, and just make, illustrate this when speaking to law, to doctors, not just lawyers and stuff. You have a situation where the relentless bombardment 
is killing is not only killing but maiming and injuring people severely in the context where the hospital are being degraded to the point where you cannot treat people. So that alone must be dealt with. And we're hoping the court comes up with a with with an order to that effect at the very least. The second one is given the fact that you're having close to 400,000 people at the highest level of food insecurity, um, you know, uh, which is at the point um, where I think it, it's called level level five, um, which means that the morbidity and mortality associated with food insecurity is at its highest. So starvation is, is, is on the horizon. And more people are more likely to die than of illness and hunger than the bombing. So again, we're asking for it at the very least a humanitarian relief that access to humanitarian resources can access Gaza unhindered. And you cannot have that unhindered without a ceasefire. Um, and you cannot have, you know, the irreparable harm argument that we've made so eloquently th um, through Blenner and others is, if we don't get in order to relieve or mitigate some of the irreparable harm that can come without some of these provisional measures, then the court is actually not giving Gazans space just to survive. And how do you then adjudicate on the merits when the harm continues unabated? Um, and, and I think that that is essentially what we'll be asking for minimally. What what we don't want to, you know, they, they, you know, we spoke earlier about what Israel's arguments could be. They focused a bit on the issue of the dispute and the jurisdiction on the dispute. Um, and I mean, we've we've illustrated through John's argument that the dispute was concretized well in advance. I mean, we you know, we've got videos of our minister talking in the Security Council that this is a genocide and two seats away from her was the Israeli representative. It was not the ambassador because it was a ministerial meeting, so it could have been somebody more senior from the government. I mean, I called in the ambassador um, when we said that we are taking you to the ICC and the instruction from cabinet to take you to the International Criminal Court is because you are involved in war crimes crimes against humanity and genocide, very specifically put in the provisions for genocide. And then already the, the arguments against the blood, you know, it's, this is not, this is a blood libel. So the idea that the, the, that Israel could not have known that there's a dispute is nonsense. And I think Judge Karoma, Abdul Karoma's, um, you know, dissenting opinion on the DRC Rwanda case in 2002 is, while he said he disagreed with some of the substantive issues um, the DRC wanted to bring across, he felt that um, Rwanda having a, a reservation on Article 9 should not have prevented the court from allowing the highest court globally to, 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 to at least engage with whether the convention was being breached. Um, he, he felt that, you know, allegations of breaches of the convention is so serious that yeah, um, you know these kinds of jurisdictional tools should not be used to prevent it. Now Israel does not have a reservation on Article Nine. Okay, South Africa does not have a reservation article, so that issue does not even apply. So the issue is concretized, and and I think we we don't want to see a situation where after the 1966, when South Africa, apartheid South Africa, was brought before the ICJ where the court used the very same sorts of jurisdictional issues to deny the, the arguments being brought together from some African states, which made the court irrelevant for the next 20 years. And that is something that South Africa was an interest in a strong, robust, but fair um, global governance system does not want to see. Finally, my last, my last question, how important it is uh, for, for South Africa, but also, of course, for the Palestine and for the international community, for other countries to now join you guys and, and be on your side for now and for the rest of the case. And, and many countries already have joined. I don't have the list on, at the top of my head, but uh, how important it is now 
for, for the global community to actually join you guys in this case? I think it's important. It's important for, for, for two reasons. Just the more countries join in and intervene, it gives the, the court a sense that, you know, there's, although this is the, a dispute between states, there's many states who feel that what Israel has done is serious enough for them to intervene. Um, and as you pointed out, you know, there's a real reluctance to intervene because of the political pressure some countries are, are feeling. But Namibia is intervening. We know Jordan is intervening. But just the the level of support from the OSC, the Arab League, from African countries, Brazil, Malaysia, I think that is that is weighty and significant enough. And I think, you know, part of why it's important is for the very first time you have a country that has enjoyed institutional impunity by some of the big powers for various breaches of international law, including war crimes. And as you may have even seen in some of the um, evidence brought forward by the Russell, Russell Tribunal, even genocide in previous attacks on, on Gaza, that that institutional impunity has been pierced. And for the very first time, they have to actually account for their actions at this for three hours, no, not, not more time, then the you know the Palestinian voice through the South African legal team was being presented with facts and law, and I think that is important that the global South can can demonstrate that part of changing the way international in the institutions of global governance have been seen as being instruments of the West can be changed, and we're hoping that the court and others seizes this opportunity to give South Africa and others the chance to ventilate these concerns and, and not to be blocked by spurious political decisions being masquerading as, as jurisdictional issues. Thanks, Zane. Uh, Zane this was uh, crucial, what you've said just now, uh, the end of, uh, of Israel's impunity. Um, we've been talking about this for decades. So uh, again, uh, you know, I, I can't talk on behalf of of the world of um you know but I, i'm sure uh, people would like to really thank you for 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 doing this because uh because that's the worst thing right when a, a population i mean just imagine being in gaza right you're being bombed you're being killed your hospitals your schools your families are being destroyed and and uh, the u.s president doesn't mention your name when he gives a declaration after 100 days of the war this is the the feeling of abandonment is, is, is incredible and and we know how many Gazans suffer from from depression and anxiety because of that so South Africa in a way is, is giving hope to, to so many people um hopefully so um yeah thanks again uh, Zane uh, and um and you know we, we'll be behind you guys for for the rest of the case of course thank, thank you very much Frank thank you